Welcome to our series of webinars. This one is on booth design. And I'm pleased to introduce Matthew Goodman, who's been with us now as a consultant for four years. Matthew is a professional visual merchandiser, amongst other things. And he's going to be presenting to you today fundamentals of a well-designed booth. Um, he's got some great imagery on this uh, presentation. And I hope you all find it very, very worthwhile and worth your time. These are just kind of good skills to carry with you whenever you've got to set a showroom or a trade show booth or whatnot to promote your products. So I'm going to turn it over to Matthew and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Nancy. That was such a warm and heartfelt introduction. And uh, for everybody listening in, welcome to the Inspired Home Show and the International Houseware Associations welcomes you. This webinar is recorded and will be posted on the IHA website under the Education tab. So for further information or introduction, please contact Nancy, who just introduced me. She's your Senior Manager of Trade Show Business Development or your Sales Representatives at 847-692-0139. I'm going to move along here. I am Matthew Goodman, PMP NCIDQ. I'll explain a little bit about that. I am an honors grad from Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City, and I actually re returned there to serve as an adjunct professor. I'm a licensed interior designer holding the National Qualification of Interior Design, NCIDQ, and I'm a certified project manager, uh, uh, PMP. So I just threw down a lot there, but basically, what I'm saying is that I get the creative side, but I also get the project management and operations side. And that's what like this webinar is really kind of about and the crux of what we're really about in this uh, this like corner, if you will, that's really specialized in the um, the show. So you're welcome to take a picture and, you know, a, a website, a web shot of this screenshot. My uh, website is available for everybody to look at. And I'm also available to all IHA members and Inspired Home Show participants for free consultation. And, I, and I'll take and answer questions throughout this presentation or even after the presentation, you're welcome to give me a call or an email. So join me. Um, I'm a 20 year expert whose career in visual merchandising spans from global trade shows and national retail giants. Uh, you've all heard of these places, I'm sure. Victoria's Secret Corporate, Macy's Corporate, Lord & Taylor Corporate, and various shopping mall developers. And in fact, if you've walked through um, some shopping malls, especially where I'm based in the Northeast, um, you've probably walked through my interior designs without even knowing it. So today we'll uncover the essentials needed to elevate your booth presentation across all price points. So the IHA is holding the annual GIA, uh, Excellence in Booth Design program based on many of the topics in this webinar. So sign up today at housewares.org or contact Nancy Michael for questions, or you can call me as well. You can access this information through the marketing kit also found through the housewares.org slash show slash marketing kit URL. So let me talk a little bit about GIA. It's exclusive to our show. And it is uh, this division of GIA is the Booth Design Excellence Program. So it's open for pre-registered exhibitors who are considered for on-site competition and global innovation awards. That's what GIA stands for in areas of creative lighting, graphic communication, logo presentation, merchandising fixtures, ways the product is presented, and the total campaign messaging. These are all the areas that we'll focus on today. So are you planning on an awesome booth display? Please pre-register for the GIA Booth Design Excellence Program. So this section offers guidance in the area of property use, color application, graphics, lighting, display fixtures, product placement, and move-in suggestions. So we'll go right into property use. So many popular movies and theater productions and you know retail stores use props. Um, that's like kind of a, a shorthand for properties to set a tone and tell a story. Props help to define time period, location, and guidance for the audience through narratives leading to the conclusion. So you all know these kind of like special props that I'm showing here. But in our area, the, the props really convey the product line essence and understanding of your product use and increasing chances of buyers entering your booth. So check this out. Props and, uh, you know, they really aid in conveying the essence of a, of a product line from like a mirror clad Buddha as the centerpiece or all the way down to just like a really simple, you know, trio of lines, if you will, in how a, a 
like a fruit bowl holder is supposed to act and function. So they can also be used to, you know, further tell a story. So the props in this case are also kind of the merchandise. So it's kind of like a cross, like that, that fine blend between like merchandising and propping out to kind of like tell a story. Like there's this kind of sophisticated, like outdoor kind of like picnic going on. So I think this is a really great example of uh, right from our show. And they can also be mixed with um, the product to like help tell and enhance a storyline. So these are all directly uh, related from our show. And these are like how props and like furniture and furnishings really help to sell a story and, and help to sell a look. And you get, you get the idea of how the item's supposed to be used really within less than half a second. I think these are really strong examples of how quickly product um, essence is conveyed from the aisle. Now check this out. They also, uh, you know, props also tell a story. I mean, I think it's really cool to have this kind of like, you know, dish train bride, if you will, um, tell a story. This is like directly from a trade show. And I just think it's really great in terms of propping, but it's also how the product is being used. So check out how these props can complete an entire look. Both props and product can be used to help tell a story. We talked about this. These photos capture two environments to promote wine openers within the same blue booth. Isn't that really cool? These are very small booths. This is like a, a 10 by 10 in each area. And I really wanted to share this with you because um, there's so many things that are right about these displays that I just couldn't uh, put them really in, in any area. So I really had to put them in the propping. Okay, check out how Neat Freak, our friends at Neat Freak, uh, use oversized props, create visual narratives by adding special props and create a unique look. I mean, check out how big the uh, oversized coat hangers are and the washer and dryer and the graphics and the front window. I mean, you can see in the upper left, right behind the yellow door, there's actually a person for scale. So you can see how like huge these are. And then to the lower right, check out how they um, are selling pieces of their, uh, their own propping. And it's these like big white shoes, pretty cool. Now, speaking of like big shoes, you know, you can have props that are inspired by other displays within other industries. Products can be used as props. So check out this. I've just put this in kind of for like a, an aha moment. I think it would be like really unfair of me to say like, you guys have to put in a gigantic, you know, shoe made of uh, pots and pan lids. Um, but what I'm saying is, is, you know, you can play with scale and play with the fact that think out of the box for how your, your product is actually used. And it would really create a striking display. So let's move on to color and texture applications. So according to Gary Seehoff, he's the president of Sophistaplate, it's easy to put together a beautiful display without breaking the bank. So a word about color, Gary and his crew place their items against a neutral background to allow merchandise to stand out. By the way, these are all paper goods. He sells paper plates. The sophisticated background color suggests an upscale quality of this product line. So I think that you might all be surprised that these are paper plates and it's called Sophista Plate, but they're putting like this really sophisticated background color and, and uh, even flooring for texture as a really great thing to make it pop and make it look like it's in another like uh, sales echelon. Color is a sophisticated tool and significant tool used in booth presentations and visual merchandising. Combined with the use of an interesting texture, color can be used to make visitors feel different emotions, suggest associations about product attributes, influence the behavior of buyers and evoke different reactions. So like, what does that mean? Okay, rough textures like faux stone, you know, fake stone and slate suggest like a rugged country look, kind of like real like Ralph Lauren country look. Smooth textures like polished metals and glass evoke a sleek urban look. So this is like, a, I like to put this, this in. This is, goods can be presented within a monochromatic color scheme. This is like your centerfold of a magazine, if you will. This is your, your breathing space for Oprah magazine. This, by the way, is a trade show display. This is not a gallery exhibit. I wanted to show you this because I think it's so important that if you think you've got kind of 
you know, plain merchandise, it's almost worth it to lean into that to make a really great, strong presentation. Goods can be presented in a monochromatic color scheme. So we're going from like wholesale to retail. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, they can be presented within like a limited chromatic color scheme. So we're showing in the previous slide, we showed whites. Now we're showing whites with like some beiges and check out how the props are show how the merchandise can be used. You know, they're obviously not selling like headbands or combs or selling the boxes in which they would go. But you can see how the props really convey the message of how the items are to be used very quickly. Uh, check out how uh, there's propping, if you will, or adding a dimension of texture on the flooring or the like the tabletop, if you will. So you've got like smooth product with rough product. Okay, this is one of my favorites too, because goods can be grouped together by a similar texture and shape. So all of the goblets, let's say, are grouped together with a similar uh, shape. And, however, they're also, if you look closely, grouped together by color, by stem, by stem wear. And same with the martini glasses that are of like that interesting wood texture. Pretty cool to have it all hold together, wouldn't you say? Here's some other examples. Our friends at Flint and Quali also show goods that can be presented with a color scheme of a limited selection. So if you don't have a lot of product, it's okay to think about multiplying and, and showing those goods in, in a, a, a grouping of one color. Okay, now we talked about groupings of one color. We're gonna go kind of the other way. The pendulum's gonna swing the other way with this, this slide. Items that are not similar in shape can be grouped together on the same texture background, which kind of like holds the story together for cohesion. So our friends at Kinetic have goods that kind of, you know, could easily quite honestly fall apart if they were, you know, visually fall apart if they were displayed in another way. But the way they held them together with the white background and then the lime framing is really great. And then also in the upper left corner, how the goods are really not that similar to each other, yet it's held together with this really wonderful framing system. Okay, so I know that you guys are probably out holiday shopping now as well, so become inspired by displays in other industries. So borrow inspiration from, uh, from anywhere. So for example, this is a furniture display in the upper left corner from the International Contemporary Furniture Fair. And then on the lower right, this is a houseware exhibit, which shows goods in a similar format of color and texture. And beyond that, they also are both showing uh, the goods that are in uh, like kind of like a diagonal area of that is cut through with a white series of like, uh, you know, if you want to call it like display plants or platforms or uh, stand ups or build ups. So you can see how these two displays really would be would like come together and it almost looks like the person who designed the Heller display or maybe borrowed that inspiration and that that idea and then they popped it into the fan display in our own exhibit. So introducing a texture in a background can better tell a story of a merchandise along with the fact that some of the textures in the uh, that are printed onto uh, the the plates are also blown up and made into carpeting and flooring underneath the display area. So they're really taking like a small segment of, of their like more traditional uh, bakeware designs and then putting it onto the flooring. How great is that? I think that's really exciting. Introducing a texture or background can better tell a story of a merchandise display. So here we have like a larger display to the left and then to the right is a smaller display. Then you can see like the smaller display takes that same concept and really the larger display and then they uh, put their merchandise on uh, one color block and then they actually feature other merchandise on yet another color area. These uh, were both uh, winning uh, for the GIA awards too. So I think these are excellent examples. Wow, talk about color. So this display featuring a splashy color would translate well to showcase other goods. So picture this display with even another flashy, splashy color, updated graphics for let's say your own graphics, keep, um, and then keep other the, the other elements. Like, um, you know, I, I really like the, 
the shelving and the uh, crisscross tables in front and the pendant lighting. I mean, this display, this exhibit could hold many, many different types of product. So feel free to kind of think out of the box on that and how your merchandise would look in a display like this. Okay, so we went from like wild, you know, jazzy colors. Now color and texture can set a tone for moods for the display. In this case, the grays unify different presentations to feature goods of various shapes and uses. So these are all um, displays that were taken on site um, with the gray palettes. And I would say that these came across as very sophisticated, lovely display and they really show the merchandise and really what the merchandise is about in just a few seconds. So I hope you were inspired by the color area. Now let's go into graphics. We, we actually talked a little bit about graphics, but I'll go into it more so. The use of graphics and photography and booth display is an effective way of grabbing attention and communicating information to the buyers. The most common form of, of communication in trade shows is through text and signage to promote new product, order minimums and show specials. So the signage, can communicate things and be short and with clear messaging. Be consistent with the brand's marketing communications model. So make it look like, you know, it belongs to your, your company and your brand. Printed logos and slogans capture the spirit of a company presentation. That's on like the exterior of really big booths. Here's one that's an exterior on the lower right and the upper left, our friends at Fusion Brands. They not only put their logo on the back wall, but they also kind of kick them up front on the, the front display platforms. I mean, I think that's like a really fashionable look. And then in the back, they have kind of like this uh, diagonal checkerboard that they placed on the display platforms. Those are just display platforms. They're really nothing that wonderful or special uh, to begin with. And then when they put their graphics on it, it just became like this new dimension and makes the booth look much more crisp and slick. So take advantage of all areas of the real estate of your booth. If your booth has a big wall up in the back, make sure to put graphics on it and make it exciting and inviting to come on in. You can promote newness, selection, promotions, your product attributes. And then they can, graphics can set the tone and educate and enhance product selections. This is an area where, especially on like the lower, I would say like almost lower mid or lower left, if you will, there's like a lounge area. And the lounge has a really big graphic on the back of how the product is to be used and the attributes of the product and how it like kind of captures the light. Then in the middle of the lounge area, which is kind of like a meeting area, that's where um, really, that's really where their, their sales take place. And then uh, what, uh, what the exhibitors told me about this booth was the fact that they actually, during the presentation, they actually place the glass items in the hands of the buyers as they're seated and the sales begin to increase there. So in a way you're kind of capturing the buyers like in a nice hospitable way and making them feel and experience the product while hopefully increasing UPTs, which is units per transaction. So the background graphics can be complex or simple and they can set the tone and educate and enhance product selection. These are really great examples of both like bigger booths and smaller booths, which do that and they educate about the graphics, uh, through graphics about the product. And by the way, check out the, um, the seating area. I showed it a little bit before in the webinar, but in the upper left, check out that graphic. It's actually got like a forced perspective of a white uh, pyramid, if you will, that carries on that look of the table. So it makes the table look much, much bigger. But really, this is a very shallow booth. This is not a big booth at all. So graphics can make the booth look even bigger too. So take advantage of all areas of your real estate. Booths over a thousand square feet are eligible to hang signs from the ceiling with the sales manager pre-approval, like our friends at SodaStream. However, even though your booth may not be eligible uh, I'm sorry, may be eligible to hang signs from above. It may not be necessary to utilize ceiling hung signage. Like our friends at Keurig, they have a uh, booth that's well over a thousand square feet, but they chose not to hang anything. This is all floor supported. Use signage and properties to educate buyers about newness and selection. 
and product attributes. So these are some more great examples of what to do in the booth. You can wear the headphones and experience the 3D virtual reality of uh, the Colombian coffee grown at our, through our friends at Nespresso. I think that's a really great idea. And then also let's talk about your company logo. Your company logo can be placed squarely on the back of your booth, like our friends at Makma. Uh, but it can also be equally as strong on the sidewalls, you know, like toward the front of the booth uh, to capture the attention from down the aisle, like our friends at Live Vivid. So don't just think that your a booth logo must go in the middle. Try to put it and consider placing it um, toward the front, toward the aisle on the wall. Most overhead signage is floor supported, like with our friends at Gleaner. And at the cookware company. Also, uh, most overhead signage um, can be floor supported from a big booth, like our friends at Berghoff on the upper left, or on the lower right, our friends at HIP. That is a uh, 10 by 20 booth. But check it out, it is a sign that is floor supported and a little higher. Make sure you uh, work with your sales manager to assure matching of the rules and regs on that. Overhead signage can be ceiling hung and shown in these examples. Uh, ceiling hung installations are for booths with pre-approval and a minimum of a thousand square feet. All right, incorporate video presentations as an integral part of the stand design. Compare your monitor rental prices with retail pricing when developing the costs. What I'm saying, guys, is that especially when things are on sale during this time of the year, it might be less expensive for you to order a, um, a flat screen TV monitor rather than to rent it in advance of the show from the show vendor. So just be sure to perform a cost value and cost benefit evaluation before you actually go ahead and uh, get the TV screen from your chosen supplier. So let's talk about lighting as well. Lighting is so important. This is really one of my favorite areas. Lighting aids in telling a story about the space. Whether a company provides a general wash of illumination to, uh, for their mass merchandising, or if a business is likely to be focused on high-end products by featuring goods within specialty lighting. So within our zone, within our like world at the job, at, I'm sorry, at the convention center in McCormick, the union labor generally electrifies lighting at the convention center. Exhibitors can install and plug in their own light fixtures and be sure the cords are correctly installed and covered and tucked neatly within and behind your booth. In this segment, we will be using the lighting terms that the industry uses, like ambient, task, and accent. So what's that mean? Ambient lighting is also known as general lighting and radiates a comfortable level of brightness without glare and allows you to see and walk safely in the convention center, you know, like at McCormick. But here's our tip. tip. This may not be enough lighting to correctly show your product. All right, so we're getting a little bit into task lighting. The task lighting might be a little bit better to show your product. It provides an improved illumination to your work area. And it may use different light bulbs in different shapes and sizes such as clip-on lamps and desk lamps and reading lamps. So I put a picture of a desk lamp in because that's a, you know, a typical piece of task lighting that we use. We perform a task under that. Everybody can kind of relate to that. But then I'm gonna shift you to like the lower right and show you the types of lighting that would be available for clip-on lighting that you could put onto like the upper parts of your booth. That's task lighting within our trade show world. Accent lighting adds drama to a booth by creating visual interest, which is used to draw the eye to an interesting place or focal point within the stand. So check it out, our friends at Nespresso have pendant lighting and our friends at Bodum have this really awesome type of accent lighting that's kind of like this giant chandelier. And by the way, um, in case you're wondering, those are, um, those are like coffee accoutrements coffee making accoutrements uh, produced by Bodum. So pretty cool that they made them into lighting. So the types of lamps are usually, that are usually on site. So here's, I'm gonna start with the tip. The tip 
is the light bulbs in the lighting industry are called lamps. So an A lamp provides warm and general illumination like in these displays. And an A lamp is easy to remember because it you know, symbolizes an idea like in the old fashioned cartoons, like ding, I have an idea and like an A lamp comes up. It's incandescent and has warm illumination. And it, it, they are, they do, you know, in the lighting industry, um, they're, they're appearing to become LED and they'll provide a cooler light than uh, incandescent. But you, you know those, so I know that a lot of you are familiar with the A lamp. Uh, moving on, we've got PARs and ER lamps for a warm and focused illumination. So you can add these on to, like generally you'll see them on track lighting, for example. Um, so you, in the lighting industry, you'll see that the PAR lamps are generally incandescent. They're moving toward LED and halogen for a warm, focused illumination. Same with ER lamps. I've, I haven't seen many ER lamps that are um, successful, quite honestly, in LED, but you can get them in incandescent too, and they'll still do the trick. And that's good for a general wash of illumination. Okay, so for the types of lamps that are really good for like those punchy, cool tones that are like for sparkly reflections, I recommend the MR collection. So for example, this is an MR16 or uh, the quartz halogens and the quartz halogens come on a spool. Like, um, you know, you could get it at Amazon, but I also saw it at like Ikea as well. So a lot of the uh, other industries, especially like jewelry, they use these uh, types of lights and it's really great for our chromes and our glasses. So in, for example, the MR16 you've seen around, there are other MR size lamps, but the MR16 is kind of like the most commonly used. It's with a bi-pin mount. Sometimes it's with a screw and base. Um, it's cool, it's, it's blue tone, it's got punchy illumination. The LEDs are now found on a spool. Um, so you can like run them across a certain area and like have that look. Um, just a word of advice, if you like eat a muffin in the morning and have a little oil on your hands, use a cloth or um, cotton gloves when handling, especially the MR16s, because they do burn out faster if they're like oily. So you wanna, you know, have them uh, last at least throughout the show. Um, other types of lamps that are uh, used are the fluorescents. So anybody who's probably seated like in an office now or uh, studied in school under fluorescent lightings, you know, you're probably pretty intimate with this. But in our world, uh, it's good for uh, the, blue co the blue tones that are like, um, you know, a little edgier. They have a wide bead spread with soft shadows. It's really good for backlighting. And these sometimes have a, either a bi-pin base if they're like the compact fluorescents, or they might have a screw-in base. So I'm sure you're all familiar with these types of lighting and lamps. We're gonna move on to the display fixtures. Display fixtures are types of furniture used to feature product in special ways. These unique fixtures are often used by retail stores and wholesale show spaces. So having merchandise that is displayed visibly within each fixture is essential. Buyers place orders on what they see featured in your booth by touching and using the product and kind of almost imagining how it would look in their store. Place the merchandise on the display fixture to prominently feature your newly launched items. And before you're purchasing a display fixture for use in your booth, consider that your merchandise must be visible and easily accessed and fit onto the display fixture. <laughs> so placing your product, okay, we're gonna go really basic now and then go from basic display fixtures to like more elevated. Placing your products on easels to present themselves in a standing position adds dimension and poise to a display. It also keeps items from blocking each other. So here's good examples of uh, putting items on display easels so they're not flat. Here's more examples of display easels in the upper uh, left-hand corner is like a display riser. And now check out how the display easels are uh, propping up the merchandise. They're actually made of wood, but then there's uh, a really great graphic uh, both next to and then a huge graphic behind the uh, product in the upper left-hand corner. So you can see that the easels really like kind of have like this new dimension, even though it's such a simple prop uh, and, and fixture. Placing products on mini platforms also and pedestals to present themselves in a standing position adds dimension and poise to a display as well. So you can like prop up the merchandise. You can imagine like how the display on the left would look without the, uh, the pedestals. It would be a little bit flat. 
and have items blocking each other. And check out our uh, friends here on the upper left-hand corner. Placing products on platforms um, can keep items from blocking each other. So they really went up high with this almost like ladder tiered system. And they even have some propping in like the Panama hat, for example, to the right of the, the black table. So we really have some really great uh, things going on with like tiering and elevating the product. Some companies choose to feature their goods with custom fixtures. So these are like obviously custom fixtures like under the mixer, et cetera. But um, some companies choose to feature their goods on custom fixtures like in the up, upper left, but other companies may choose to showcase their goods on stock fixtures, which is the lower right. Stock fixtures are just like you buy it you know, off the shelf, if you will, and you put it in your booth. Now, other companies choose to feature their goods on like semi-custom fixtures, which are stock items with a special unique quality. For example, on the lower right, um, these are uh, special made Lucite shelves that are on a stock fixture. So kind of like, you know, adds a special dimension. And then, okay, now some showcases may choose to showcase their goods using combinations of both custom fixtures, which are against the wall on Danica Studio, and on stock fixtures on the floor. And then other companies may choose to showcase their goods by combining fixtures, fixture parts. So um, you might put like a marble table with stock uh, legs, for example. So feel free to have the liberty to use your own creativity within your own budgeting for creating your display fixtures. And this is kind of like my wrap up. Don't overlook the use of stock fixtures. With some signage and props, they may just do the trick. These are all stock fixtures with their own like propping or signage. Um, I think that all of these kind of like really do the trick. And um, I, I think that they were also well within budget. So product placement. This is kind of like the area that you've all been waiting for. Adam Schachter from the president of FHE Group, and he's the co-founder. We work tremendously hard to ensure that we not only have innovation in our product lines, but in the way in which we display and present them to our retail partners at the show. This means that each and every year we focus on developing a new booth strategy to ensure that we have freshness at the show. Booth design and innovation is a key driver to our success. A word about newness, Adam and his crew place their new items on display in key areas. So that makes him our hero. More on that in the next pages of this section. But let me go back to that quote in that area where he says that uh, he works with their retail partners at the show. If I can read between the lines, he's saying in so many words, he's trying to show how his goods will look in a retail store setting. The overarching concept in displaying goods in a wholesale setting is to consider how your selection of merchandise will look in store. Capture the best way your merchandise will present itself for final retail destination. Offer an opportunity for your buyers to visualize how well your goods will be seen in their own store environment. So this section is called From Wholesale to Retail. We talked a little bit about this before, but we're going to kind of dive in and take a deeper dive. Our friends at Nespresso have, this is an actual wholesale display from on site at our show. That's their wholesale display up top. You can see on the bottom um, in the retail setting, by the way, that's Target. And yes, we have permission from Target to show this, uh, how the goods look in store. I mean, it, it's a retail setting. So yes, on the lower left hand item, you're, you might just have um, like other people's boxes, you know, that are displayed up there for, for back stock in a retail setting. But you can see on the uh, lower right how well Nespresso's display really cut through from the wholesale setting to the retail setting. You know, same with our friends at Sip by Swell. Uh, in the wholesale setting, they're showing like a broad selection and have a broad breadth of merchandise. And in the retail section, they're showing the, the depth of the merchandise, but the, the look is like kind of like almost the same. It's, it's almost identical. 
So these are our favorite things. The next step to studying how a grouping of merchandise behave in a space and how it's best featured. So get a feel of the most trafficked area of your booth and you'll have the ability to depict the flow of how buyers arrive at your booth as well once you study that trafficking. Divide your merchandise into three groups. Here it is guys, newness, impulse and flow. Newness is the goods that your company is newly promoting within this group and you must identify your items that are poised to be the top performers. Goods that are being introduced at the inspired home show. Newness is also known as the new hero. So your impulse mer merchandise, goods that are poised for add-ons to increase units per transaction, that's UPTs when ordering. This type of merchandise is referred to as the sidekick. All right, so within this grouping of sidekicks, you'll have identified the secondary item that will enhance the larger order and place it in a visible position near the new hero. Your flow merchandise, all right? Goods that are created to hold a cluster of items together, yet are not necessarily poised to be the top performers. Companies that offer kits to, of items that usually have this type of merchandise are like, for example, tongs to a martini shaker assembly or checkered tablecloth to a picnic set. You know, the flow is, is really, you know, kind of holds it together. So take photos of your display booth to document the final design and merchandise placement. You know, you can do this and share that with your retail partners. You could also just do it for your next booth setup. Keep the presentation of your merchandise clear and distinguishable and don't let the overwhelming use of products or display props become the villain by upstaging your merchandise and potentially eroding sales. So the villain struck here, dun dun. <laughs> That's my favorite part, guys. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the villain here. Um, it, it will, it does erode sales. We don't really understand what's going on here in less than a half a second. Uh, what's the product uh, selection? What's the cut through? If there's uh, certain deals going on, uh, how it's shipped, how it's potentially shipped all together. So I would say the villain definitely struck here. So our hero to the rescue, dun, 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 dun. our hero to the rescue. Uh, okay, examples of the merchandise displays featuring our hero product. Heroes can be repeated or shown singularly. Examples of merchandise displays featuring hero products, which are usually placed against the aisles to grab passersby. Okay, that's a different concept than retail because sometimes heroes are placed in the back of a retail store to like create the traffic flow. But in our case, since the booths are kind of, you know, shallower in general than your average retail store, the hero goes up front, I would recommend, as a, uh, like a stopping point for our passersby and our big buyers. Uh, examples of merchandise displays that show hero products like en masse. Here are usually heroes um, to, to grab a lot of passers-by. This is like really, really great example of our heroes. And let's go back to a little bit of basics within the hero section. Goods can be shown in colorways. Heroes can be shown in different colorways. We kind of get that uh, through this example. And they can be shown in stories. So for example, here, the heroes are definitely the chairs and the table, for example. Um, so you can get a kind of a feeling that this is like more of a story and a merchandising uh, look and, and almost like fairy tale, if you will, if you wanna really push that definition of a fairy tale. Goods can be shown in stories as well, like in a smaller booth. Like for example, I would say the hero here is most certainly the textiles and uh, the mugs in the lower right. Okay, so goods can be shown in a boutique style presentation or a mass merchant style presentation. So it really doesn't matter the type of merchandise that you have, as long as you like really pay attention to how it's shown and how it's like caressed within the marketplace. Try different ways of showing your goods and have fun with your product presentation. This company, Live Vivid, has their goods on display using many different techniques from laying out products to showing items with easels and you know showing like a cross mix of the merchandise. And then, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about taking pictures of your product and sharing it with your retailers. So here, here's Barbara Cook's planogram example. So take photos of your display booth to document the final design and merchandise placement for future reference or planogram development. Let me show you some um, real planograms that kind of came to life right in your local retailer. So you can see the essence of how a planogram from uh, a display booth 
might really help a buyer to plan out their merchandise within their own visual merchandising world within their retail sector. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about move-in information. I noticed that a lot of the uh, exhibitors who are uh, setting up the booth are kind of like assigned that because they, you know, happen to be good at like the operations sector, uh, though they may not be strong in the uh, creative department. So that's all right, because according to Daniel Koziel, he's the CEO of Koziel, the better the booth display, the bigger the smile. So Daniel and his crew emphasize use of props, color, graphics, lighting, fixtures, product placement, and move-in suggestions. And, you know, we're getting a little humorous showing Daniel and his coworker trying to move in amongst all the boxes. But really, there are three general methods for delivering your products um, for booth setup purposes, okay? So there's pre-shipping for large parcels, there's personal drop-off through the ASUV program, and there's pre-shipping for small parcels. So visit the houseware shot uh, dot, uh, org uh, URL and for this information, you're all welcome to take a screenshot of this. So let's talk about the pre-shipping. It's recommended for exhibitors who are from outside of the Chicago area. They've got like heavy freight or shipping from another convention center, like in a caravan setting. It is not recommended for to ship fragile, expensive or prototype items or parcels that are advertised the content. So basically don't, you know, uh, order a flat screen TV and ship it in that box. Cause you know, people are gonna look at it and know there's a flat screen in there and you're gonna uh, not be happy if it doesn't arrive. So you must ship to the holding warehouse or convention center within the specific time frame prior to the show. Depending on your booth package, most goods will be del delivered directly to your booth. The ASUV program is our personal drop-off program. This program is recommended for you if you are located nearby and can fit your items into a vehicle no longer, no larger than a van and have expensive or one-of-a-kind one of kind prototypes. You can park and unpack within 20 minutes while delivering your items to your booth using your own manually operated cart. For participation and eligibility, you must have a vehicle no longer, no larger than a van, two people in the vehicle, a valid parking pass, and one person to stay with the parked vehicle while the other shuttles parcels to the booth. So then now there's small parcels. So if you've got a small or individual parcel that must be sent separately from your larger shipment, it is advisable to ship this to yourself at your hotel. Small parcels are usually delivered to the convention center, but may not make it to your booth in time for show opening. During the show, for expensive items or prototypes, there is a designated free security lockup area with guarded overnight storage in each hall. Do not store valuables in your empty boxes, which will be stored by Freeman. And stored empties are not accessible during the show. During the show and included in your booth fee is Freeman's Concierge Elite Program. This is a premium level of customer service to exhibitors of the Inspired Home Show. Exhibitors can remain in their booths to conduct business while handling concerns with Freeman traditionally handled at the nearby service desk. And this provides additional attention and enables the tracking and resolution of exhibitor requests during the run of the show. So you're welcome to find out more details at the Freeman website. And the uh, Freeman Concierge Service is a great service. After the show, generally goods are shipped out of the convention center by the same method in which they arrived. Check the exhibitor services manual and ask Freeman or your EAC uh, for outbound shipment directions. EAC stands for exhibited, uh, Exhibitor Appointed Contractor, the guy who sets up your booth. After the show, IHHS offers a product donation program if you wish to donate your product to a charity rather than ship it back to the show. The show has pre-authorized charities for this program, so visit your setup manual for uh, this program and also uh, abandoned merchandise, which is not uh, going through this program and it's just abandoned in your booth. You may um, be uh, fined or uh, something else may happen as well. So I would recommend to uh, have, have you participate in the charities program. So does your booth hit the target? Ask me to check out your booth while on site too. I'll be on site. Your stand could be featured on this page too. All right. Does your booth hit the target? 
Here's examples of big booths that totally hit the target. And here's examples of small booths that totally hit the target. I love the example of these booths and they're both winners of our GIA awards as well. So does, at this point, does anybody have any questions? Are there any questions that came in? Hi, Matthew, I do have a few questions oh, that's for great. you. Some questions came in, that, that's fantastic. The person who usually handles our booth set up just got another assignment and now I'm acting as the lead to get our booth up and running because I happen to be packing uh, good, well, I'm good at packing. Can you give me a brief countdown of what has to be done because the paperwork seems so daunting and a bit intimidating? You know, that's a really great question and something that like a lot of my exhibitors I speak with on site uh, that they fall into that category of like, hey, you know, I, I just got assigned this. I really am not good at booth display. I, I'm really better at something else, but our usual display guy, like either, you know, he's not with the company anymore or he, he got another assignment and a promotion. And now I'm kind of like, you know, handling this and the, and the baskets in my hands. I would say that there are two things. Um, there's an exhibitor action checklist under housewares.org. And then you can look up the action checklist like in the search. And there's also a marketing kit and a countdown calendar for the marketing kit. That's also on the housewares shot, uh, housewares.org slash show um, slash marketing deadlines. So those are like the two like main areas I would definitely go to uh, for that. The action checklist really basically boils down all of your deadlines. Um, especially with the Freeman deadlines coming up. I, I know that there's a Freeman deadline coming up of February 12th for all pre-orders. So if I could have anybody take away anything of this, please mark your calendars for February 12th, 2020, by which you must pre-order anything from Freeman or else there'll be a substantial increase in price prices. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, there is. Um... Hold on one second. We'd really like to use a projector at the show to get a much larger screen than a monitor, but several trade show exhibitors have advised against this for lighting reasons. Can you think of a projection does well at a trade show? Are uh, there any secrets that you can share? That's so funny. I was just at a trade show um, in New York where I saw a projection. Um, but I have to say for it to be successful and having a conversation with that exhibitor, it, the projection must be short range. So they actually put the projector kind of like at the front of their booth and projected it on the back wall. So you're looking at like a, uh, like a seven to 10 foot range of where, of the projector to the, the image. I also have to say that the image was not nearly as crisp as a, uh, let's say a flat screen liquid crystal TV that is available for rent or you can buy and ship to the show. Um, and also it depends on the area of your convention center, if it's kind of dim or uh, well lit. Uh, if it's actually a well lit convention center area, your um, projection isn't really gonna be that crisp because you're gonna have like a lot of light pollution, if you will. But if you're in a dimmer area, it'll be more crisp. I hope I've been able to answer that. And if that exhibitor would like to contact me after this, I'll be happy to have a free consultation with them more so about it. Okay, sounds good. We have a few more, Matthew. When launching a new category or brand at the show, what should be considered? Um, well, let's like, just go back to basics uh, in your launch you can actually promote that through uh, certain like vehicles and and branches through your marketing kit. Uh, and uh, also through the marketing kit, there's uh, press announcements that you might be able to take uh, take uh, advantage of. I don't know that much about the press part, but you can certainly look into that. 
uh, and I can find out more about that if you'd like, if we could have a conversation about that offline. But also, let's talk about your your line. I mean, we I would divide your line up into your your hero, your sidekick, and, and your your flow merchandise, and think about how you would arrange that within your uh, area, and also um, take advantage of the fact that um, your uh, your hero can be repeated many times if uh, you only have one hero. Hope I've been able to help. Okay, great. Um, what would you say an aver average budget for a good booth would be? Well, that's a loaded question, guys. Um, I mean, th this uh, presentation incorporates ideas of big booths and small booths. So you've got all different sizes and budgets. Um, and I, I, I almost like hesitate to throw down a number. Um, just like in terms of like security. Uh, and I've also seen booths that are quite sparse and I know that are low budget and look fantastic as well. I, I do think that if you are dividing your budget up, whatever budget that be, that may be, your percentage is gonna be like a certain, per, like the larger percentage is gonna be like shipping and drayage, which is also called like, uh, you know, in-house uh, materials handling and movement from the back dock to your booth. That's the good chunk of your budget. The other chunk of your budget is gonna be um, the purchase of the actual booth, because in this show, uh, you're renting really a slab of cement. Um, and then the other part of your budget, I would say is gonna be like flooring and then lighting and electric, because you really wanna uh, illuminate that, that merchandise. So I can't really tell you the exact amount of, uh, of dollars, uh, because I just don't know that much about the background and, and like the the look and the feel and the dimensions and the and where you're shipping from, but I can tell you that like proportionately, I tried to give you the right percentages of where your money's probably going to go. All right, great. Um, you talk a lot about display fixtures and furnitures, but where do you actually buy these things? Um, yeah, there's, I mean, aside from like our friends at like, you know, Amazon and Ikea, Home Depot, Wayfair, there's also a National Association of Store Fixture Manufacturers. So you can look them up at nasfm.org um, and they'll show like, you know, so many uh, store fixtures uh, and that's where a lot of the store fixture manufacturers kind of like showcase their um their items as well depending on the size of the booth like if you've got like a let's say a 10 by 10 or 10 by 20 i i would honestly start with like amazon or ikea i've seen some really great items from there and then if you've got like a really big display like you know anything that's let's say 50 by 50 or something like that then i would really look into uh, nasfm.org, National Association of Store Fixtures Manufacturers. Hope that helps. <laughs> and one last question. It oh kind gosh, of you, guys are, with you guys are great audience. There's so much participation. I, I can't believe it. I have a general hunch about how to set up our merchandise in our booth. I'm actually overwhelmed by the big amount of space yet the small size of our product. We have glassware in boxes. Any suggestions? So you've got like, I guess you've got like glassware in boxes. It sounds like they're kind of small-ish compared to like the large size of your booth. <clears throat> if I can like read between the lines of this question, it sounds to me like this exhibitor may be a seasoned exhibitor from a smaller booth, like a 10 by 10, and then they got a bigger booth, yet their product um, selection and dimension remain the same, which happens a lot, but then it gets like a little overwhelming. So I would consider displaying goods both in and out of the boxes and think of how the items will look on the retail shelving. Kind of think about who your audience is and, and set up a retail shelf or a series of shelvings, how you, would think that that it should look in on display in in the store 
so that when a retailer comes by and says, well, I don't know, and they would might hem and haw, you could draw them in more so and say, this is how it would look on shelf. And then I think that might help a little bit. Uh, so we're really kind of carving out the way that you're selling through the way that the booth is being displayed and set up. And also you can show goods in the same quantity of your order specifications. So if you've got like a show special or a minimum and you wanna show how those goods look once they meet that show special or like you have a minimum order, you could show it that way as well. So there's all different ways to kind of show it beyond like an artistic way. You're almost getting into like a retail math, if you will, at that point. But I do think if you're catering to retailers, this is like the, the way that I would suggest to go about setting up a booth. Um, any other okay, questions? Okay, I believe that's it, Matthew. And on behalf of IHA, I would like to thank you once again for an amazing webinar. Stay tuned to uh, uh, his next one. And for those of you who have any questions, feel free to contact Matthew directly. And uh, have a great day, and thank you again for joining us on Webinar Wednesday. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Again, you're all welcome to contact me, and have a great day. See you at the show as well.